Thank you, James, and, and thanks everybody for coming to the, uh, to the session. What I want to talk about today is around the, the quote from the IPCC's third assessment report, which essentially said that the climate system has only limited internal variability. This was the quote that really set me thinking about this whole human-caused global warming business, because it seemed inconceivable to, inconceivable to me that two fluids interacting on a rotating solid Earth would have only limited internal variability it seemed a little bit strange. And so uh, that's what set me on the path to, uh, to looking at the uh, alternatives to what might be the human-caused global warming uh, uh, hypothesis. Of course, the Earth has got quite a bit of variability, or the, the climate system's climate uh, variability, and we see this just in the global temperature record, and this is from, the, uh, uh, from Roy Spencer's uh, group, their lower atmosphere temperature from the satellite. What we have is the, both the tropical and the global temperatures, and we see that they actually go almost hand in hand. But the thing that we do see is that the amplitude of the tropical oscillations or um, movements away from the mean are much greater than the global, and so we can, con can assume that the, uh, the driving of this variability is actually in the tropics. And of course, a lot of the driving is through ENSO. And if we look here, we've got four panels which indicate 12 months apart the depth sections across the equatorial Pacific. The left-hand side is 19, uh, 19, uh, 19, uh, 1997, and the next one is 1998. The major El Nino event, or the decay of that, and uh, the top panel is the depth section, and the left-hand side is about New Guinea, and the right-hand side of each panel is the South America, going down to about 500 metres. And what we see is quite a, a significant difference in the heat content of that upper ocean layer. In the 1997, it's very warm, extending right across to almost the, to the uh, South America. On the uh, right-hand side, only 12 months later, there is a major difference. And if we look at the anomalies, up to eight degrees warming in the subsurface layer in 1997, but up to eight degrees cooling only 12 months later. Now, this is not radiation, this is internal variability of the climate system. Maybe only in the surface layer, but it's there. So, ENSO is not a radiation-driven phenomenon. As ENSO progresses, we get vari variations in radiation to space. It's the temperature of the climate system that's determining the radiation, not the radiation determining temperature. So what we want to look at this morning is, is there potential for the ocean circulations on a larger scale to regulate global temperature? And we look at the deep ocean circulations. And this depth section, this is a, a larger scale to what we showed previously, and we can see on the lower right-hand corner where it goes down through the Atlantic, from Iceland down to the Antarctic, and it goes to the bottom of the ocean about 5,000 metres. And I just confirmed with Roy Spencer that, yes, this is something that uh, he had circulated and I'd pinched. I don't know where the origins of this is, but it's a very good graphic because it shows over on the left-hand side there the cold water forming under the ice sheets, uh, the, the sea ice of, around Antarctica, falling down into the uh, bottom of the ocean to form uh, deep water. And we normally talk about this as a density-driven circulation because it's the the cooling of the surface, the formation of sea ice, the expelling of, of salt, increasing the density of the uh, surface water, which causes it to, to sink. But what we don't have much discussion about is what happens in the return current, because the return current has got to go against the stability of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the ocean. It goes from very cold water, down near zero degrees, up to the surface, which is around about 25 to 29 degrees. So what is happening? Where does the energy come from? And so we look at the uh, a mean cross-section again across the Pacific, and what we see is that there is upwelling in the, towards the uh, South American coast, cold water is coming up, and where there is more upwelling, 
the surface temperatures are cooler because what's happening is that the, the cold water is coming up but solar radiation is warming the surface layer and there's mixing through wave action and so forth, bringing heat down and allowing the, uh, the, surf the deep water to come up, cross over the thermocline and come into the, to the warm surface layer. So heat is being used in this uh, process. And a very uh, simple diagram there showing the upwelling in the Pacific, or the, sorry, the, the, the equatorial regions and then the poleward movement of the surface water. The poleward moving, movement, uh, the moving water loses heat to, the, to radiation to space, but the upwelling interior water is consuming the uh, excess solar radiation in the tropics. So the question is, um, is there some regulation, some limitation on the amount of over, overturning that can take place? And so how much actual heat is being consumed by this upwelling water? We make some very quick assumptions that the circulation time is about a thousand years. This is what's generally being reported to us. That the average ocean depth is about 5,000 metres. We saw this from the depth section. And that the vertical column water warms about 25 degrees in the ascent. And it's a very straightforward calculation, back of the envelope sort of thing to show, that we'll need about 25 watts per square metre continuously to warm that water as it rises to the surface. So this represents about 35% of the available excess solar radiation. If we look at the, the annual top of the uh, atmosphere net radiation, the excess in the tropics is about 70 watts per square metre. And that about uh, 25 watts of that is required for the, to satisfy the upwelling water in the overturning circulation. So what we see is the circulation time of the, of the uh, ocean is not limited by available heat, that there's still plenty of heat left in the, uh, in the uh, excess solar radiation to allow us to bring that water to the surface, plus there's also heat available to export to the polar regions by the atmospheric circulation. As the, uh, <coughs> from the surface water, heat and latent energy is passed to the, to the atmosphere and that's transported to the, uh, to the polar regions. So what happens if we change the speed of overturning of that circulation? We find, of course, that less solar radiation is required to warm the cold water that's mixing up through the thermocline. More solar radiation is available to warm the surface, and so more heat is available to, to export to the, uh, the poleward regions. And we saw this during the El Nino uh, episodes of that first diagram, that during the warm periods, there is heat available to go to transport to the, to the poleward regions. So we can deduce that a slowing of that overturning circulation will lead to heating of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the climate system, of the surface waters, and uh, heat available for the, for the export and a warming of the global system. An accelerating thermohalo, uh, th uh, circulation, of course, will lead to global cooling. That's just the opposite. More heat is required to bring that water to the surface. And so what we see is that uh, there is overturning taking place. Changes in that overturning will change the, uh, the, the climate, not only at the, the small or the, the short-term scale of an of a interannual variability of the El Nino, but also on these much larger time scales of the thermohaline circulation. How can we change the thermohaline circulation? Well, we look to the, to the great planets. The, um, the issue is that we know that just the Earth's rotation and the Moon going around gives us tidal variations of the, of the ocean at the surface. At the other end, we know that the major planets, uh, uh, Jupiter and, uh, and uh, Uranus, they will, they'll actually, uh, and Saturn, will, when they come into alignment, they'll drag the, the Sun out of its uh, position in the centre of the solar system by at least one solar diameter. So there's very large forces operating. We also know that these planetary motions will change the orbit of the Earth, the, uh, the precession, the obliquity, and also the eccentricity. And we know that those orbit characteristics are related to the long-term climate. So the question is, does the planets and so forth, 
also affect the circulation to give us global change, or is it, as has often been said, it's only just solar radiation and variations in solar radiation over the poles? Remembering that the main circulation, or the main variation, is in fact the 100-year cycle, and the eccentricity of the, of the Earth is on that 100-year cycle, but whether the orbit is circular or highly eccentric, the Earth intercepts about the same amount of solar radiation. So we must have a very complex feedback unless we're finding that there's this overturning, is, uh, the, the planetary motions is affecting the overturning, which is in, in concert with the, uh, with the uh, planetary motions and the, the global temperature. One, it's possible to look at this and say, look, this is a period of increasing circulation and overturning and a period of decreasing because it's in terms, in, in concert with the uh, planetary motions. It may or may not be, but it certainly allows us to look at other things rather than just uh, carbon dioxide and, and global uh, it's causing climate change. So we look at the gravitational effects of the relative planetary motions, which are very important for the, uh, the solid part of, the, uh, of the, the planetary systems, but is it also important for the liquid uh, the hydrosphere, with its overturning circulations and climate. So in summary then, we've got an opportunity to look at something else beside the uh, radiation variations as being important for, for climate change. We're looking at the circulations of the ocean. Uh, it seems to me, as I said previously, that uh, it's inconceivable that the oceans are not interacting with the atmosphere and also possibly with the uh, planetary motions to give us some form of climate change. We come back to the proposition which uh, has been put forward on many occasions is that the oceans are the inertial and thermal flywheels of the climate system. But it seems to be neglected in the radiation arguments about uh, climate change. We should, I think, come right back to the, to the fundamentals, the sorts of things that we uh, have been learning in climatology for at least the length of time that I've been associated with it, and that's the importance of the oceans. Thank you very much.